And we want to welcome everybody and, and say thanks to everybody for joining us for Global Radio Ideas webinar number 12. My name is Ken Benson from the P1 Media Group. Uh, P1 provides research, consulting, and strategies to stations worldwide. And joining us from Germany, uh, my co-host, Andy Sandeman, who is the CEO of Benstown, a leader in imaging and production. Hey, guys. Happy you're all on. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, don't forget, we do have the chat box open. So if you have any questions today for Lee, feel free to uh, type them on in and we'll get to as many as we can by the end of the webinar. Wanted to give an introduction to Lee. And, and honestly, we could spend the entire webinar talking about what Lee's accomplished in his career. But we're going to try and give you the, uh, the speedy Cliff Notes version. Um, he spent five decades in the trenches reinventing radio, TV news and print. He's passionate about the past, but the distinction here, he says he's focused on reimagining the future. He's consulted over 1,000 radio stations, 12 major print publications, TV stations, cable networks, consumer products, and he's the designer of XM Satellite Radio. He's known as the founding father of album-oriented rock, which uh, became uh, a huge format in the 70s. Newsweek magazine listed our guest as one of America's 100 cultural elites. He's a Grammy award-winning producer, and his clients have included uh, so many, but here's some headlines. The Moody Blues, Bob Seger, Iron Maiden, and you can see the Iron Maiden platinum record over Lee's shoulder. Um, Capitol Records, Rolling Stone Magazine, MTV, Disney, and much, much more. He's even appeared as a guest on The Apprentice with Donald Trump. Um, He's currently working on a new book, tentatively titled Solutions for a Creatively Starved Planet, and working on a documentary called Sonic Messengers, When Music and Radio Change the World. Welcome, Lee. Great to be here. Appreciate it. This should be fun. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know. Andy's picture disappeared. Andy, are you still here? Okay. No, he's not. Um, Germany, we lost you. Uh, so, Lee, let's begin uh, by telling us something people don't know about you. Well, probably the uh, main thing is I'm a commercial and instrument rated pilot. People who know me might know me as kind of wacky uh, and wouldn't trust me in an airplane, but I uh, actually uh, go into my um, sort of real focus mode when I fly. And uh, I've got about 9,000 hours and uh, wow. fly on all my, most of my business trips. And um, it's just a, another passion of mine. That's incredible. Um, There's a picture the only other that thing was uh, coming back from uh, Cleveland, flying over Lake Michigan and route to Chicago on uh, a nice uh, sunset. Yeah, very nice. The only other thing I wanted to do besides radio in my career was to fly planes. So I'm very envious that you've achieved your dream and goal. And I'm just blown away by how much you've accomplished in your life and where do you find the time to do all these things. But um, thanks for sharing that. Oh, no problem. So when I first called you a month or so ago and asked if you would be interested in joining us today, um, I was concerned that you being a futurist, that you might have said that there's no hope for radio. And at that point, I was kind of stuck. Well, do I have him or not have him if he doesn't believe radio has a future? But I was relieved to hear that a visionary like yourself and somebody of your stature believes radio can remain a viable and meaningful medium. So before we get into how radio can do that, why don't you tell us, um, in your opinion, what is the state of radio today? Well, I think you know, the, on the upside, it's in a very fortunate position of having uh, amazing accessibility. Everybody's got one, uh, certainly in the car and in, the, in most people in their home. Uh, that's the positive news. Uh, the negative news is, I think, that we're in an era of unbelievable competition to FM and AM with satellites and streaming and technologies that haven't even yet emerged yet. And now is really the time radio, and when I say radio, I mean FM and AM, should be on creative steroids, completely reimagining themselves, um, just breaking down barriers, creating new sounds, 
matching the energy and the excitement of, of the 21st century. And uh, I just think personally, a lot of radio stations are stuck in some uh, mid 70s or 80s focus group hell, just regurgitating things uh, that have been done for years and years and years. I, I refer to it as creative autopilot. Um, you know, I see new stations launching and, uh, you know, they'll maybe get a morning show, test the library, throw up a few billboards and, you know, that's it. Whereas, you know, creating an amazing station takes tremendous brain power and, uh, and focus. I remember when stations used to launch in the uh, 60s and 70s, the great stations, you know, there'd be a month or two in the, uh, in the trenches trying to, you know, sort of imagine what the station could be and, and create the, the vibe and then launch. Um, and I know there's economic challenges today, but what I'm talking about isn't uh, spending a lot of money. It's brain power. It's just rethinking. And I think that's where radio's big challenge is to just, um, you know, blow up the playbook and uh, reinvent itself for the 21st century. And any specifics on what that may be or, or how we get there? Oh, God, a lot of them. Um, I mean, I can just go through a list of some of them. I think um, uh, musically, radio's got to reclaim its core artists. Uh, you know, it used to be where, uh, oh, an artist would come to town and they'd uh, stop by the radio station and play. And you don't see that anymore. Uh, artists are now owned by places like Spotify and uh, and the like. And uh, radio needs to, to reclaim its artists, even if they're oldies artists, claim them and celebrate music. Uh, you know, the church might celebrate the Lord. Well, the radio station celebrate its, its music. And again, I, I like to, um, whenever we launch a new product like XM, uh, what we do is play tapes of, you know, radio's golden you know uh, music era and uh say how can we create that magic on today's terms and i remember you know growing up in chicago uh herman's hermits record would come out and wls would you know meet the plane at the airport that had the pressing from england to you know rush it to the station and put it on the air and you know a sort of celebration around music uh production i mean radio should be theater of the mind uh, and now you hear the same kind of production. It's almost like the same same person does everything. I remember when I would uh, travel from uh, Chicago as a kid, Chicago to Miami, you'd go through Indianapolis, Louisville, Nashville, Atlanta, Jacksonville, and end up in Miami. And every station had its own signature, its own sound. You make that same trip today, everybody sounds exactly the same. So I think there's tremendous opportunity to really pull out our, what I call our George Martin gene to create, you know, magic between the songs, amazing production that, uh, you know, isn't part of the, is a new, uh, isn't part of the old production playbook. I mean, I still hear Star Wars sound effects. Very cool in 1977 when Star Wars came out. But I mean, this is like almost, what, 50 years later. <laughs> and stations are still using that, or Man in the Box, you know, which was very clever in the uh, in the eighties. But you know, stations are still using that, and it's just uh, it's it's a parody of itself. So I mean, that, the list goes on forever. But uh, and I could mention other many other things. But I think it's getting back to what created the great radio stations, and by that I mean the ones that really made an impact, whether it was. Uh, KHJ in 65 or the loop in 79 or, or whatever. Uh, and studying those and seeing how can you create that magic, but on today's terms, you can't necessarily just replicate it and expect it to work. It was years ago, but those characteristics that made those stations uh, can be reignited uh, and uh, to help create some amazing stations today on today's terms. So, I mean, there's a lot, but it, I think the bottom line is it's using mind power, really thinking about it. We did a thing, uh, just one quick story. Years ago, uh, I was uh, consulting a station and went into the market, and the station had a three share. 
whereas historically they had AIDS. They were kind of in the ratings toilet. And I got with the manager and uh, program director and said, let's get you, me, sales manager, the engineer, all the key players together, lock ourselves into a hotel suite with a bunch of radios, listen to ourselves and the competitors, and just tear it apart and reinvent it. And uh, sure enough, we did that. Poured out of the hotel room at uh, four in the morning with legal pads. Uh, must have been a dozen uh, yellow pads full of ideas. And as a consultant, I'd leave and then come back uh, a couple weeks later, a month later, and I'd be all excited. You know, wow, well, uh, how did we do? Are we executing those ideas? Uh, how about this one? Well, no, no, we researched that a little bit, a little too scary. How about this one? Well, no, no. Um, we had a little committee meeting and sort of voted it down. How about this one? Uh, home office never let us do this one. The bottom line is they did none of them. And um, that's where we came up with a, a line called AFDI, which means actually, well, frigging doing it. There's a stronger F. <laughs> but uh, AFDI was a mantra at XM. Come up with an idea, we do it. Uh, and in the case of that station with the three share, the next book came out. It was a two five, you know, they didn't do it. So um, I think it's important to uh, tear things apart, rebuild it in AFDI. And uh, I mean, the competitors will be shocked. They won't know what to think. Well, they're still using the old playbook. you got something that's just mind blowingly original and uh, that can make a lot of difference. And again, it's not money. All those things we talked about at that hotel room, none of them cost any money. Uh, some of them might have been ad supported, but they were generally just new ideas, new, new ways of doing things. And, um, and uh, we saved a lot of that for XM, which is one of the reasons, at least in the early days, it was very inventive. But uh, AFDI was definitely our mantra at XM. So, and it's funny if um, uh, our attitude was if it doesn't, it's not going to completely blow up the uh, the company or get us in legal trouble, anything goes. That's where we came up with the line, the creative batting average. You come up with 100 ideas, and in baseball to terms, if 30 of them work, you're a star. You're a 300 hitter. Nobody will remember the 70 that didn't. But most people are not even taking any creative at bats. So I would encourage people to just take at bats, and if 3 out of 10 work, and the 70 that don't, nobody will remember those. You know, you just... Uh, but those 30 can make a difference. I mean, that ties in beautifully in the next question. And I think you already answered that kind of, um, you made a career out of reinventing and reimagining possibilities. What does radio need to recapture its former glory? I think if we answer that with F F A F D I, I think we're almost having the answer to that question here. So uh, we might want to jump right into the next one because there is some fantastic content Lee, on your website. LeeAbramsMediaVisions.com, and we highly recommend our viewers to check this out. One of the statements that's uh, stuck with us is, young people have never heard great radio. One of the biggest challenges radio faces is engaging young people. How do we bring the young people to radio? And I think that's a question a lot of programmers are battling with. So could you elaborate on, on that one a little bit? Like, what is your advice on that? Yeah, uh, going back, again, another XM story. When we first uh, were putting XM together, we did some research and uh, found that uh, people over 40 were like really into it. Wow, this sounds great. All these great channels, no commercials. Younger people were like, why would I pay for that? Radio sucks. What do I want 100 channels of that for? And that really got us <laughs> sort of scared. And, uh, but, you know, they were right. I think uh, to really uh, reach the younger people, it requires completely blowing up the playbook. Uh, it just, the current programming playbook, I don't think works uh, under 30. Um, I think it's just uh, dated and cliched and, you know, the Simpsons make fun of it on the TV show. It's, uh, it's so out of date. And uh, I think it requires just completely new programming, uh, completely new architecture. I'll give you another. I like to use XM examples because we had so many channels there. But one, we, uh, one example we didn't really execute because the technology wasn't there yet. 
it was a, a channel aimed at teens. It was called 20 on 20. It's where it was 20 songs over and over again, but all songs were uh, determined by listeners, either faxing in, calling in, emailing in, texting in, whatever. So the uh, 20 song cycle changed every time based on listener voting. If they thought uh, they, meaning the masses thought uh, Britney Spears was getting burned out, they could uh, vote it out, make it from go from number one to number 19. Or if there was some crazy novelty song that some bunch of people uh, recorded in you know Philadelphia, there be, could be enough people in the state that could call in or write in or whatever, uh, text in and make that number one. So it was completely de- democratic. It was not based on any chart, any call out. It was the top 20 over and over again with no jocks, actually, just amazing production. And uh, it just changed every 20. And it really, we thought, could really get people involved. And that song sucks. Let's vote it out or whatever. Uh, but I think it's that kind of thing that's just uh, really a radical change from the current uh, sort of youth radio approach. And uh, But I think it, it really t- would take something along those lines, that, that radical, that different, that um, you, you can learn from MTV. That, when that came out, that was like, holy shit, what is this? And I think you need that, pardon my language, but holy shit, what is this factor? With a with a new station, and um, and I know there are still stations that do real well there. But if somebody doesn't do well, and uh, has that youth as a target, man, they should take advantage of it and uh, create something just mind blowingly different. I think that's the only way, because otherwise, you know, they're uh, very happy with the Spotify's and the Apple Music's, and it's probably going to get more and more that way, unless radio. FM radio particularly really takes it by the by the hand and and fixes it radically. So um, that's what I think. So, so Lee, are there any stations you can think of today that are maybe doing some of what you're talking about or taking some chances and maybe paving the way to a different future? Uh, you know, not really. No, I wish I could say yes, but uh, I can't think of any offhand. Uh, I'm sure they're That's out That's very there. sad. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, again, uh, it's sort of like that story of uh, traveling, driving from Chicago to Florida. Everybody kind of sounds the same, and everybody's kind of on autopilot. And uh, there was a new station that launched here in Chicago, and, uh, you know, they could have been just balls to the wall. And it was just, you know, um we got a morning show and they uh, you know, got standard issue promos and liners and, and it's just, you know, disappointing. Yeah, no, I agree with what you're saying. And in fact, you know that after my programming career, I've, I've kind of moved to the research side of things. And so many times in so many markets do we hear people say all the stations sound the same. And they're not really talking about the music. We know the music varies from station to station. But as you talk about the production, the liners, the imaging, the slogans, everything is very, very similar. And yeah. it's only the music that really changes. Even the uh, specials, another thing that uh, was always a trademark of stations were the uh, franchises, the features. Uh, you know, in the 60s, there was Chicken Man. And in the 70s, you know, there was Two for Tuesday and Block Party Weekends. And uh, you don't hear Chicken Man anymore. We still hear Block Party Weekends and Two for Tuesdays. And uh, just those same, what are now cliches. And so there's possibility of creating a whole new generation of features. I'll hear stations, you know, still running, you know, 10 at 10 and things like that, which are really wow at the beginning. And some of them, you know, have their value, but you don't hear many new ones being introduced or invented. And again, that's another classic example of costing no money. You know, it's just like come up with a new idea that can become a franchise and the, uh, and, uh, you know, a new, a new trademark. Um, and you, you talked about music, and uh, again, I think stations um, uh, aren't really you know, engaged in celebrating music. They're sort of playing it. I think I wish more um, stations that had uh, jocks really embraced it. And I wish stations would dig more. I remember this is AOR, but 
uh, we used to uh, encourage program, well, just staff members to go to flea markets, try to find cool records they can play. And um, we did a lot of that at XM to the point where uh, we, we created a channel called Special X, which was the most bizarre songs ever recorded. <laughs> things like parakeet training tapes and things like that. And we actually played those. But finding just cool audio, um, digging, you know, not just relying on... Uh, well, the one scary thing is, you ask the program director today, you heard any good music, and they'll look at a, a sheet and say, no, nothing this week. I mean, they haven't even listened or gone through the effort of uh, trying to find things that could turn their audience on. And um, that's just a mindset, musical mindset. Another autopilot that needs to uh, needs to change. So, Lee, I wanted to ask a question because the video that you recorded for us to help promote your appearance today, you talked about radio being in a creative crisis. And um, what I mean, you're a visionary. You've helped so many companies, even outside of radio, reimagine. Um, what advice do you have to radio to become more creative and and take more chances and have the, I guess, the guts to do something that hasn't been done before? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. And uh, it all is in the attitude, um, creating a, you know, an attitude that is, uh, I actually have something here I wanted to, to, um, to mention along those lines. But uh, it's the attitude that, uh, we're going to actually AFDI. We're going to do something here. We're going to change this. We're going to evolve. And we call it the rock and roll thinking. And uh, there's some points to that that need to be ingrained in the leadership. And some of those points in rock and roll thinking is, uh, I mean, it's a style of thinking that needs to be ingrained in people. And some of those points are eccentricity all the way to the bank. You can be eccentric to a, a one share, but... Um, you know, encourage eccentricity, hire eccentric people. Again, eccentric uh, doctors or police officers, probably not a good idea. But people in the entertainment business, eccentric, eccentricity is valuable. Innovation as a driver in everything you do, it just drives your the station culture. Uh, swagger, a sense of confidence. I think a lot of people in radio... Uh, don't have a lot of confidence in the power of their medium. I mean, they're still as beat up as radio is getting. It's still very powerful. It's, it's again, everywhere. And I remember uh, that swagger was important when MTV emerged. A lot of stations said, oh, God, we're sunk. MTV, you know, it's all video. Video killed the radio star. But no, no, hold on. You know, we're in charge. It had to be the attitude. A newness, a struggle to be first. And these are all characteristics of great timeless rock bands, too, that can be integrated into the radio thinking. But uh, newness, really struggling to be first on something with a new idea. Um, creating fans and not users. Uh, it's not that hard to create users, but turning users into fans is very important. Um, competitive where you're just fighting for success. Uh, you just want to be first and bigger and better. And, you know, that's just again in, in the DNA of the culture. Uh, artful. Uh, be a media artist. Because uh, great art uh, can create commerce. And uh, I think in radio, in a lot of media, art's sort of a bad word. That's kind of arts and crafts that gets you in trouble. No, I think the artistics, when uh, done properly, is powerful. Um, rebellious, I think you know, got to be a, a rebel, uh, you know, sort of vibe in the, in the culture. And that can even mean uh, for an AC station, you know, just a little, little rebel edge, just, uh, you know, we're here to change things. We're, uh, we're here to rebel against the status quo. Mass appeal intelligence. This is where it's smart. It's not dumb. Some radio, and it doesn't, doesn't matter about ages. It's just, a, it can be street smart, but it's just smart and not stupid. And so many stations lie to listeners. <laughs> the first, the best, the most, most variety. Uh, you know, uh, it's just, America's in particular, and I'm not sure how it is in the rest of the world, but probably the same. The bullshit radar is on high gain. 
you know, years ago, you could say more variety and people, oh, really? Now it's just, it goes right over your head. I was in a market, it was about a year ago, driving along from the airport downtown and there were a bunch of radio station billboards. And all the billboards either said the new, which the station wasn't new, or <laughs> most variety. And, you know, they're trying to market change instead of actually change. Because they didn't have more variety. They did a focus group that said, listeners want more variety. So what do they do? They don't change the playlist. They just put up <laughs> and say, more variety. And uh, so mass appeal intelligence is another thing. And again, all the great rock artists, whether it's uh, you know Bob Dylan or Jimi Hendrix or whatever, all have these characteristics. And they can be integrated into radio thinking, I think, um, uh, to, to help drive you know, the uh, difference. I tell you, Lee, those uh, points were worth the price of admission today. I mean, that's <laughs> really excellent advice. Okay. Absolutely. So, okay. Lee, um, radio versus audio. We talked a little bit, like, um, obviously, about your opinion and the feeling that radio is uh, still strong and can be stronger. So it's something that we hear all the companies reposition uh, just in the last couple of weeks and take the word audio as part of that brand name. Today, it feels like many of us are kind of embarrassed that we say we work in radio. So me personally not, but I mean, I get this vibe that audio is just like, that's the cool word everybody wants to use right now. And it's obviously more targeted towards commercial partners, ad agencies and so on and so on. But should we really feel that way? That we are like in the radio or in the audio business? Because I personally doesn't do like a big, Like for me, it's not a big difference if I'm in the radio and audio business because basically, basically both is audio. But does that even matter? Like, in your opinion, like how is the position? Like, no, uh, I don't think it really matters. I mean, uh, I, I can see how some companies are struggling to the point where they uh, they want to disassociate themselves from radio to illustrate that they're more than radio and they do podcasts and they do all these things. But I think that at its core, radio is. Um, you know, is, is shooting itself in the foot. The term is fine. And all radio has to do is create magic and that term will be cool again. So um, I don't really think it matters. I think it's a marketing term that uh, helps identify companies in the corporate and agency world. But uh, internally, I think we need to think of it as radio and our job to make it really magical again. Um, It's sort of like, uh, what's another example? Uh, movies, you know, it hasn't changed in, you know, a hundred years or whatever. Um, but uh, the reason is they keep reinventing themselves and movies get better and better and, and more and cooler and cooler. And they never had to, you know, change it to video. Um, so I think it's up to radio to uh, make the term cool again. <laughs> Uh, rather than necessarily change it. Oh, we're audio now. So, no, you're not your radio station. That's just my opinion. Okay, we're, we're chatting with Lee Abrams. As you guys can tell from watching so far, truly uh, a visionary, an extraordinary programmer in his day and uh, has left an indelible mark on all he's done and obviously providing some great advice on how radio continue to uh, win into the future. If you have a question for Lee, we already have a time um, in the next few minutes to take a few questions today. So if you have something for Lee, please add it in the chat box. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, so just want to jump back. I mean, you were named Chief Programming Officer of XM Satellite Radio 20 some years ago. We were involved with all of a sudden launching 100 new channels on satellite. Uh, and you took a lot of risks. You made a lot of changes. Um, What can we learn or what can FM radio learn from that experience today? Well, that was an amazing time. Um, several things. First of all, we got there. It was a blank uh, canvas. And um, so I think even a station that's around a long time needs to get out the blank canvas. And so we're able to really uh, create from, from scratch. And... Um, We also hired right. Out of every 100 people we talked to, 99 didn't get it. Uh, there'd be that one that did. And we gave them the opportunity to do radio for the reason they got into radio in the first place. It probably wasn't reading liner cards. Um, 
So hiring right, having a blank um, uh, canvas. And then we did boot camps. We did these for two years. And they were fantastic. Uh, they were to unlearn everybody, everything they've ever learned about radio and relearn it the XM way. And it sounds very, you know, uh, it sounds kind of ugly. In fact, it was liberating. People uh, just loved it. And uh, it opened up their minds. It, uh, it just took them to a whole new level of thinking. So I, I'd recommend uh, boot camp for uh, even local stations to uh, just really teach the essence of the audience and the, and the format and, and the possibilities. And um, it was helpful that uh, the ownership uh, came out of telecommunications. So there wasn't a lot of um, resistance to change. They, they, they were, uh, uh, you know, they were uh, telecommunications guys without a, an agenda in radio. And uh, so that really helped clear the way and uh, very valuable. And I think if there is upper management getting in the way, have a good conversation with them and have a, have a plan. And uh, amazing things can happen. But um, overall, you know, it was a wonderful experience starting from scratch, hiring amazing people, putting them through the boot camps, and just inspiring them to do the best radio of their lives. And uh, I think, you know, it worked. Um, XM's uh, merged and it's gone through a lot of changes, but those first couple of years, first 10 years were just uh, unbelievable and some radical changes. And AFDI was very important because people would come <laughs> up with an idea and uh, be shy about it. Now let's try it. And we actually also, we built a cliche buzzer. If anybody gets buzzed three times, they're fired. Nobody was fired, but... That'd be like somebody says, well, let's do a Super Tuesday, <clears throat> you know, cliche. And that got people out of the cliche thing real fast and uh, started, you know, some new, new sort of thinking, new, new angles. But that was a really amazing experience for uh, that and a lot of other reasons. And there was a sense of mission, too. We were out to, you know, out to change the world. Um, and I think radio, even though it's a satellite and it was national, the stations can still have that that attitude again, that swagger to, to uh, you know, we can always change the community. We can change the pulse of the city. So, Lee, I'm I'm really curious about the boot camps you had. You said you would teach people to unlearn things they came with about radio. What were some of those things that you said? Okay, that's we're not doing that anymore. Oh uh, well, a lot of the uh, the cliches the. Uh, that every station uses and then the block party weekends and two for Tuesdays. And uh, a lot of the cliches were, uh, were cleansed from our system. Um, a little bit of talking over records. Um, you know, we found uh, that, you know, people hated that. So we didn't talk over music. Authenticity was really, really learned and important. We couldn't, we had a lot of very niche formats in each of those formats, we needed real specialists. Uh, if, I mean, our blues format had real, you know, blues guys running it. And our metal uh, formats had metal heads. And so uh, we learned how important passion for the music was uh, within a, an individual format. And another great authenticity example I always thought was, was amazing was our, well, our oldies channels, particularly the 60s channel. Because we added uh, reverb, we bought the old Pam's jingles. Uh, we hired people who could, you know, scream with the best of them, and it was a time trip. You'd listen to that station, you think you were in 1965 again. So um, authenticity is real important. Finding, and they always, often, a lot of times, didn't come from radio. They came from uh, different places, or not commercial radio. A lot of them came from NPR. Some came from record companies. So the hiring was, um, you know, we hired for passion rather than track record. I think that was an important characteristic. Absolutely. I mean, talking about reverb, I think, and then can we want to jump into the questions, right? Um, you said before you're a big believer in, in between records, um, not just the spoken word, also the imaging, and we talked a little bit about that. So what do you feel like, what do we need on the radio in terms of imaging um, why do you think we need to completely reinvent 
um, the imaging as well. Because I feel well, that's kind of like came through a little bit before, right? That's kind of like what you said before. Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, it all sounds the same. Nobody's taking any chances. But we're so limited. I mean, I can see uh, production that includes accents. Why does it have to be this big voice? I mean, it can be a Jamaican accent. It can be just different <laughs> accents, uh, different instruments. Instead of, pew, pew, you know, you can use bagpipes, harps. Uh, exotic sounds, uh, modified sound, backwards, sped up, um, song bits that are actually out of format can be very effective. I remember in our Liquid Metal channel, and I also did it at Z-Rock years ago, uh, we hired a square dance caller to do sort of heavy metal square dance calls. You know, uh, <laughs> I can't remember, but imagine a, a real square dancer doing heavy metal lyrics. Um, scanners and shortwave radios, orchestral sounds, the new age and, and electronic, uh, clips from radio dramas, nature sounds. Um, you know, it's we got to just get away from being locked into these radio sound parameters and think more like, again, a media artist that's got this whole universe of sound to work with. Use it. Because, um, uh, again, the, uh, I think the universe of sound is that radio uses is so narrow and it's radio, you know, it's again, theater of the mind. It's, it, it can take you places it can transport you. And that has to be the attitude and, uh, and the hiring production people who uh, aren't spot cutters, but are really imagineers and can, uh, can just mold sound into something really special. And just that alone would give a station such a sonic edge just being the station that uh, sounds different, sounds cooler. I doubt if you go to a focus group and people say, well, I like the production, they probably wouldn't get that specific, but they'd say how like magical the station sounds, it, it transports you. So again, I think like an artist, think like um, you know, you're know you in Pink Floyd or something and you just want to create, uh, create amazing sonic landscapes on the station. Excellent. Well, Lee, we have about five minutes with you today, so okay. we do want to get to some questions. But um, as we knew going into this, that uh, you know, trying to compress you into forty-five minutes and get all your wisdom was going to be impossible. So I want to tell everybody right now: if we don't get to your question, Lee has agreed to come back on June twenty-fourth, Thursday, same time. So mark your calendars, and of course, if you signed up for this, you'll be getting some emails about that next month. But he will be back to talk about some of the things we. <coughs> don't have time to get to today and to answer as many questions as possible. So um, thank you in advance, Lee. It's great to have you here. Um, so let's grab, let's, let's grab a couple questions in the moments we have remaining here. Uh, one comes from a guy named Dave. Should radio continue to compete against Spotify and the other pure plays or should radio blaze its own trail? I think radio should blaze its own trail. It's got so many advantages. And the Spotify's, you know, uh, as powerful as they are and successful as they are, they're really jukeboxes. There's no experience. So I think uh, the radio experience, when done right, will trump this, the Apples and the Spotify's and their jukebox approach, which, again, is valuable. I listen to Spotify, love it, and Apple Music. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the radio experience for a radio station is what is going to take it to the next level. Scott Williams uh, asks, how can we get smart young people to come into the business? That's an interesting one. That is tough. Um, the first thing, you know, I think it all gets back down to creating these amazing radio stations. People say, hell, I want to be part of that. Um, you know, you talk to a lot of young people today and radio just isn't very interesting. Uh, and it's based on the way the local stations sound. So I think the first step is creating these amazing stations uh that people go god i want to be part of that and i think that's uh that's the only thing that's really going to do it uh the other thing i guess is uh recruiting um getting away from just hiring within uh and look outside uh and it could be anybody from just clever agency people to comedians to whatever i think most of them probably wouldn't have the aptitude for radio but you might find the one that does but I think the bottom line is, again, creating those stations that uh, are magnets for people. Because right now, 
you know, sadly, I don't see a lot of younger people going, wow, I'm going to be at that station. They're cool. It doesn't happen. Um, maybe morning shows, but, you know, as far as uh, being, you know, the rank and file at a station, it's just not very attractive based on the way stations are sounding. Okay. And I think maybe the last question for today, John is interested in your opinion on stations promoting podcasts instead of radio on air listening. And what do you think about stations promoting to listen to the stream where we have to pay for listeners? Um, no, I, I still think uh, there's, there's value there. But the real answer is getting to listen to the radio. I think that's, that's the home run. Uh, and the podcast can be, you know, if a, if a station performer's got a podcast promoting, that's fine. But I think the real key is, no, you need to get them to listen to, you know, 95.7 or whatever the frequency is. That's really the, the home. Well, Lee, um, we want to thank you for today. Um, there was just, uh, it was a great conversation, some incredible advice, and I am absolutely looking forward to part two because I know there's so much we wanted to ask you about that we didn't get to. So we'll, we'll do that next time. And I know next time too, you agree to take as many questions as possible. So if you're watching absolutely. today, we need to get to your question. Or if you have questions, um, Lee's probably going to take 30 minutes of questions next go around. So um, yeah. Use yeah, it, we'll save his, it for next time. Yeah, pick his brain, that's for sure. So, All Lee, right. thanks. We'll, we'll see you on the 24th of June. Um, if you re want to rewatch this video from today or share it with anybody, it will be posted tomorrow on the P1 Media Group website, also on Benstown and our social media channels. And Lee's going to get it up in various places as well. So, it will be readily available for you to watch again. Absolutely. Guys, it was a Great. pleasure. Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. It we'll talk to you in June. Thanks for watching, Thanks, everybody. Guys. All right. Cheers. Yep.